the story of the elder Nanda. Shortly after his enlightenment, and when the teacher had set in motion the glorious wheel of the Dharma, he returned to Rajagaha and took up residence. His father, the great King Sardodana, sent ten ambassadors to him, one after another, with the instruction, Fetch my son hither, and show him to me before my face. But each ambassador, having approached the Buddha, was given a suitable teaching, attained arahatship, and failed to return. After the tenth ambassador had attained arahatship and failed to return, the Buddha travelled with his retinue of 20,000 arahats to Kapilapura. The following day, the Buddha entered the city for alms. On entering the city, he considered what the countless other Buddhas in the past had done and saw that rather than going to the house of their father, they had gone for alms door to door. And so this is what he did. On hearing of this, his father, King Sadodana, and his stepmother, Queen Mahapajapati, went to the Buddha and said that it was unseemly that he should go from house to house seeking alms. The Buddha replied that it was the tradition of his lineage that he did so, that lineage being the countless thousands of Buddhas stretching far back in time. And then he uttered the following verses. Arise, do not be heedless, lead a righteous life. The righteous live happily, both in this world and the next. Lead a righteous life. Do not lead a base life. The righteous live happily, both in this life and the next. By the recitation of the first stanza, the Buddha established his father in the fruit of stream entry. By the recitation of the second stanza, he established Mahapajapati in the fruit of stream entry and his father in the fruit of the second path. On the following day, it was the wedding of Prince Nanda to Janapada Kalyani, the Buddha's half-sister, considered the most beautiful young woman in the country. While the housewarming and marriage were already underway, the teacher entered the house for alms. He placed his bowl in Prince Nanda's hand and wished him good luck. He then turned and proceeded to leave. Out of reverence for the Tathagata, Prince Nanda did not dare say, Reverend Sir, receive your bowl, but thought to himself, he will take his bowl at the foot of the stairs. But the teacher did not take his bowl there and so Prince Nanda followed him out of the house, all the while thinking, surely he will take his bowl here, surely he will take his bowl there. But the teacher continued walking all the way to the monastery, and the Prince Nanda followed, even though he greatly desired to return to his bride. At that moment, word was brought to his bride, Janapada Kalyani, my lady, the exalted one, has taken Prince Nanda away with him. It seems his purpose is to deprive you of him. Thereupon, Janapada Kalyani, with tears streaming down her face and her hair half combed, ran after Prince Nanda as fast as she could, and having caught up with him, said, Noble sir, please return immediately. Her words sent a quaver through his heart. But the teacher led him inside the monastery and said to him, Nanda, would you like to become a monk? So great was Prince Nanda's reverence for the Buddha, he could not say he did not wish to become a monk. So instead he said, yes, I should like to become a monk. So it was on the third day of the teacher's arrival at Kapilapura, he caused Nanda to be made a monk. Shortly after this happened, the son of the Buddha, Rahula, approached the Buddha at the behest of his mother to ask for his inheritance. As soon as the young boy Rahula saw his father, he immediately felt a great affection for him. The following thought occurred to the Exalted One. 
the paternal wealth which this youth seeks inevitably brings destruction in his train. Behold, I will bestow upon him the sevenfold noble wealth which I received at the foot of the Bodhi tree. I will make him a master of wealth that transcends the world. And so he instructed the venerable Sariputta to make Prince Rahula a monk. Now the Buddha's father was upset that his grandson had been admitted into the order. He asked the Buddha to ensure that in future no youth should be received into the Sangha without the permission of both the mother and the father. The exalted one granted this request. A few days later, when the king came to visit the exalted one, the teacher gave a teaching in the form of a story, and at the conclusion of the story, the king was established in the fruit of the third path. Having established his father in the first three fruits of enlightenment, the Buddha returned to Rajagaha with his congregation of monks, and then shortly after that he left with his congregation of monks to visit Anathapindika in Sawati, to reside in the newly constructed monastery in Jatawana. While the Buddha was thus residing at Jatawana, Nanda became discontented and told his fellow monks of his discontent. He said that he intended to leave the holy life and return to the life of a layman. The exalted one, hearing of this incident, sent for Venerable Nanda and asked him whether it was true that he said he was discontented and wished to abandon the higher precepts and return to a lower life. Nanda replied, Reverend Sir, when I left my house, my noble wife Janapada Kalyani, with her hair half combed, took leave of me, saying, Noble Sir, please return immediately. It is because I keep remembering her I cannot endure to live the religious life any longer. Then the exalted one took the venerable Nanda by the arm and through his psychic power conducted him to the heavenly world of the 33. On the way there, the Buddha pointed out a burnt field with a greedy monkey sitting on a stump who had lost her ears and nose and tail. When they reached the world of the 33, the Buddha pointed out 500 celestial nymphs when the Exalted One had shown the Venerable Nanda these two sights, he asked, Which Nanda do you regard as the more beautiful and fair to look upon? Your noble wife Janapada Kalyani, or these celestial nymphs? Reverend Sir, replied Nanda, As far inferior as that greedy monkey who had lost her ears and nose and tail is to Janapada Kalyani, even so far inferior is my noble wife Janapada Kalyani, to these celestial nymphs. They are infinitely more beautiful and fair to look upon than her. Then be of good cheer, Nanda, replied the exalted one. If you continue with your work in the holy life, you will at the very least win rebirth amongst these celestial nymphs. So strong was the allure of beauty for Nanda, and so beautiful were these celestial nymphs in comparison to anything in the human realm, he readily agreed to return to the holy life and continue to work diligently with the promise of this reward. Now when they returned to the human realm, Nanda at once withdrew to a solitary life of meditation. However, it soon became well known amongst his fellow monks that his newfound enthusiasm for the holy life was the enticement of the heavenly realms. As a result, they developed a contempt for him and mocked him because of this. Nevertheless, Nanda persisted in his practice of meditation, withdrawn from the world, heedful, ardent, resolute and fully aware, and in no long time he attained the highest goal of the holy life. On the attainment of that goal, this did he know. Birth is at an end, lived is the holy life, duty is done, I am no more for the endless round of rebirths. And there was yet another venerable elder numbered among the Arahats. And there arose within the exalted one also knowledge of the following. By extinction of the taints, Nanda, even in this life, himself abides in the knowledge, realization and attainment of freedom from the taints, emancipation of the heart, 
emancipation by wisdom. At the end of the same night, the Venerable Nanda approached the Exalted One and said he released him from the promise he made, that he would win rebirth in the heavenly realms if he put forth effort in the holy life. The Exalted One replied that the instant the Venerable Nanda had attained Arahatship, he was released from that promise. A few days later, a group of monks approached the Venerable Nanda and asked whether he was still dissatisfied. And he replied, Brethren, I am in no way inclined to the life of a layman. These monks could not believe the Venerable Nanda had so soon changed his attitude and went to the Exalted One to report that the Venerable had said something which was not true. The Exalted One replied, Monks, in former days, Nanda's mind was like an ill-thatched house, but now it has become like a well-thatched house. From the day he saw the celestial nymphs, he has striven to reach the monk's goal, and now he has reached it. So saying, he pronounced the following stanzas. Just as rain breaks through an ill-thatched house, so lust penetrates an undeveloped mind. Just as rain does not break through a well-thatched house, so lust never penetrates a well-developed mind. Sometime after, following the Venerable Nanda's enlightenment, the king became ill. The Buddha went to him and gave him a teaching, and the king attained arahatship and passed into Parinibbana. Shortly after that, Queen Mahapajapati requested ordination as a female mendicant. After the Buddha's primary attendant, the Venerable Ananda, interceded on her behalf, the Buddha agreed and admitted her as the first female nun, founder of the Bhikkhuni Order. And what became of Janapada Kalyani? That tale is told in the story of the nun Rupananda.